You are listening to Worst Marathon Ever. Welcome back, everybody, to the second worst marathon ever here on That Gets My Goat. I'm Big Anglovich. And I'm Rich Outfield, and we're going through the Pixar rules of storytelling. I believe we're on number three. That's right. Rule number three. Trying for theme is important, but you won't see what the story is actually about till you're at the end of it. Now, rewrite. Okay, so that was an inside baseball one, too. That's... You said yesterday's was very writerly. I would say this one is much more writerly still. Um, That's an interesting rule. I know, for one thing, film scripts are rewritten hundreds of times often before they finally go to, uh, you know, to the set and shoot them. And on an animated film like this, they, they can get rewritten as the animation is coming and is developing and they see scenes and they're like, oh, here's new stuff. Right up to like the sound mix when they put in new jokes and new lines and new stuff for the minions to do. And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So yeah, I, I, like on an animated film, you probably have more rewrites. You know, Which they, is kind they of... show a rough cut and it's not like in a studio film. Where it's like, well, this is all we shot, and now we have to edit things out, and maybe we'll do reshoots or whatever. On an animated film, it's like, well, we haven't rendered any of it yet, and let's yeah. change this guy's design, and let's remove this character altogether. That's kind of funny that you say that, too, because back in the day, Jeff Katzenberg showed up to Disney, and they're like, he's like, yeah, what you need to do is change this and this. And they're like, what are you talking about? This is an animated film. We can't just reshoot things. We've been drawing this stuff for a year. Whereas now it's a totally different process. <laughs> they, they can change it up all they want all the time because uh, it's not like that. It's not like, hey, we, we drew a hundred pictures to make this two and a half second bit. Yeah. And Katzenberg talked about, you know, that he made no friends right. by that because he said, I don't care. You will cut this. You will make it shorter. You will make it less violent. This was the Dark Crystal he was talking No. This was the Black Cauldron he was talking about. <laughs> Dark Crystal. You know, so they, they did what they could to, uh, to make it more his way. I remember that when it came time for... Shoot, what's the name of the director of Little Mermaid? Do you remember? Is it Musker? I don't. John Musker, something like that. And I could be wrong. I know there were two directors, but... When it came time for Musker to show their work print, you know, when it's just pencil sketches and the voices, to, I guess it would have been Katzenberg at the time, right? That there had been pressure from the producers to cut part of your world, which is this, you know, the song that Ariel sings, the I Want song. Because it stops the story in its tracks you know, for a song or whatever. And it, it was going to be expensive to, to animate. And this was back when Disney really had money problems. And they had made the Black Cauldron, for goodness sake. They, they didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> Poured a lot of money down a big hole and nothing came back up. But Howard Ashman, who was the lyricist and was, you know, sort of a co-producer on this thing and had really grabbed on to Little Mermaid as a passion project. Um, once he was brought on board, he would never leave. It was his thing. He was like, absolutely, you can't, you can't cut part of your world. You just, just please just trust me, show it to Katzenberg and, and, and the board, like the board of directors and all that stuff were, were in this screening. And he's like, if anybody complains about it, then you can cut it out. But to me, that's the heart of the movie. And so they showed the little mermaid to that. And, it, and if you've ever seen one of these work prints, they're rough. Yeah. It's not just the movie in pencil, but there's moments when there's no animation at all and it just shows you a storyboard or, you know, it's like the absolute worst abstract image because they, they didn't know what they want to put there yet. And, and you just hear the voice and suddenly the screen goes white or whatever. But Musker said that people cried during part of your world. And that's what the movie is about. It's it, that song 
is The Little Mermaid. That's the theme. And it's the greatest moment in Disney animation history in Rish Outfield's personal opinion. <laughs> the absolute plateau of Disney animation is part of your world. That's, again, me on a soapbox. That's what I believe. There's not been a song or a moment better than that in anything. But it's easy to take a step back once you've seen The Little Mermaid and said, okay, what is it about? What is the movie about? What is the theme of The Little Mermaid? And, you know, I don't know if, if they had to get to the end and realize that that's what it was about. Because there was all sorts of stuff that they cast aside in Little Mermaid. There was going to be a lot more like politics where King Triton was Ursula's younger brother. And Ursula was supposed to have ruled the, the, the oceans. And King Triton had done so, sort of a coup kind of thing. And she wanted her kingdom back. And eh, all of that is gone. The, the, the movie wasn't about that. You know, it was about this girl who fell in love and and wanted her prince so much that she was willing to give away up everything. And, you know, it cost her her life, right? And I don't know at what point they decide, okay, maybe it doesn't cost her her life. Let's fix that, too. <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't in the first version. It wasn't in the first draft. She did become Seafoam at the end, right? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that sort of thing only came about after that song. After you feel what she feels and you know what she wants and you're like, I felt that. I love Ariel. That you don't want her to die. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, that is interesting. I don't know. We've talked a lot on our show about Dean Wesley Smith and some of the uh, recommendations that he makes. And one of the things that he, he says is you, you, don't, you write your story that you want to write and you don't rewrite. When you're done, I mean, all you do is fix typos and stuff like that. And, you know, if somebody says, hey, continuity error or something here, or hey, maybe this should happen. And you look at it and say, I suppose that is better. You're not supposed to rewrite according to him. And Heinlein, I think, was the one who made the rules. And Heinlein's the one that says only at. No, he was the one that made the original rule. And then. Uh, what's his face added it to it? Ellison. Yeah, Harlan Ellison said only if you agree to the editor's request. But anyways, so we've talked about that a lot. This rule here is it flies in the face exactly the opposite of that, where he says write your story. Now that you know what it's about, rewrite. I suppose there are different ways you can do that. For example, making a really detailed outline before you start writing your story is sort of a way of writing your story and then now you rewrite by filling in the blanks to it. And now that you know this is what it's about, this is what I should do as a theme. I remember in film school, one of the things that, and I don't know if it was our screenwriting teacher that told us this or someone else, but they talked about, you know, the, the movies that mean the most to people that are the most tend to be the most successful and that really work are those that have a theme a sort of a moral or a lesson that you're learning from the story not just hey let's all have some fun okay the end those are the ones that people you know really remember really you know that are that are worth the most i don't know exactly what it was that they were saying but basically they were saying theme is good Make sure your story has a theme. That you're teaching people something. And you don't, obviously, you don't want to be didactic about it. You don't want to hit them over the head with it. But having something is really good. Can you read the rule again? No. Trying for a theme is important. But you won't see what the story is actually about till you're at the end of it. Now, rewrite. Well, that, see, that sounds like it's twofold. It also sounds like it's saying, don't try and come up with a theme and write your story about that. It, it, you know what I mean? It, it sounds like they're saying, don't have that in mind while you're writing the first draft. Uh -huh. And I, I don't understand. I mean, I, 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 I understand and I don't understand. I, okay, so Stanton said that the inspiration for Finding Nemo was how overprotective he was of his first child and how he just, you know, every little thing, every time he fell down, he had to grab him and pick him up and, oh, you're okay. And, and he wanted to shelter him and he freaked out because he's like, I'm not always going to be able to 
be there to do this for him? Like, what what would happen, you know, if if he was on on his own and he I I and he began to worry more about himself than he did about the kid of what what he would do if his kid disappeared or whatever. Isn't that what Finding Nemo is about? I think so. But and that was the inspiration for Not it. Not a very so, fun life for little Chico. Nemo. Nemo. That's a nice name. See, I I don't know. I, I think having a theme in mind helps you, you know, aim for the, the, the target or, or it does. Okay, so what could... Shoot, I, I don't want to be that guy. But I'm not, is it okay if we let California reach in for a minute? I, he's been out there. He's like despair. He's out there waiting. Okay, well, it, if we'll just let him come in for a second... So uh, I wrote a sequel to Birth of the Sidekick, which is a story that that some people have have listened to or read and, and really liked. And I liked it too, and, and you were the first to like it. True? Ah, of you're course. I'm California about, rich. You're talking about Birth of a Sidekick, not the sequel to Birth of a Sidekick, which I have never seen. No one has ever seen okay. Birth of a Sidekick. Okay, sorry. Yes, I was the first to like it. But I wrote that this year, and... I decided, okay, so I, I, it was just going to be the further adventures of Ben Parks, who's the main character, this, this boy in this Arizona town, western town. I decided, you know, I was going to have him have this adventure where um, this guy comes into town and he used to document the stories of the lean rider who was this, you know, gunslinging hero that everybody admired and respected that was introduced in the first book and he or the first story and he was to be the sidekick of the lean rider and this guy writes up the lean rider's adventures he interviews him and then he publishes them and he splits the money the proceeds with jerome cook who was the lean rider and he comes into town and ben has to with the help of the sheriff maintain the illusion that the lean rider is still around and still having adventures and and that's what this the, the sequel was going to be and I thought, well, yeah, but where could that go? I don't... And, and I didn't know. It I could still, have been one of those wacky madcap stories where, you know, the lie keeps getting bigger and bigger. And uh, that's probably not what you were after, though, huh? It, it wasn't. And, I, <laughs> and, and it's hard to look back at the first story and say, what's the through line there? What is the theme of Birth of a Sidekick? Because I'm too close to it. But, but if I had to guess... I would say, okay, where there's this kid, he wants to prove himself. He wants to be something. He's an orphan. He's a nobody. He lives in squalor, and there's not going to be any chance for him to make a name for himself. And he gets this opportunity, and he doesn't want to blow it. And the opportunity is blown. And yet somehow he's still able to make something of himself, to be somebody. I I don't know. You've read it. Is that that the theme of... Well, the theme of Birth of a Sidekick is wanting to be somebody. And so I thought, well, what's the theme for the sequel? The theme is pretending that you're somebody, that you're not, that somebody that you're pretend. And I just, I I didn't like it. I, I, I tossed it. I was like, what I want is, I want Ben to, to want a family. That that's what he really wants, is a family. He, he was an orphan. And then he had a chance for a surrogate father, and that was taken away from him. That's So he wants a family, and so he's going to seek it first with the sheriff, and then he's going to seek it with a, a new gunslinger-type character. And suddenly the story came alive for me. It was just, well, how can he seek a family and keep not getting it. And this was exactly during that time when Dave Wolverton said, if they achieve their goal, then it's a short story. But if they fail, there's obstacles, and they come back again, and there's a new obstacle, then it's a novel. And keeping that in mind, it made that, that story, novella, novel bigger and bigger. And I started to care more and more about Ben getting what he wanted. And so, I mean, I had to have... California Rish say this because it's self aggrandizing. It's talking about something that I've learned. And that's what those guys in all the panels who are writers do is they talk about their writing. Like, this is what I learned, and this is what you can learn from the stuff that I do. And believe me, I got a big dick. And I was like, why would you say that? What? How, how does that? Okay, I'll buy your book. 
I say that because I'm from California. That's right. So it's true. Anyway, to me, having that theme in mind helped make a story that, of course, nobody has ever read. So I don't know if it's good or not. But it made me invest in in it more. And, you know, maybe that's still following the Pixar rule. Because, you know, I, I wouldn't think that they would write a whole screenplay and then go back and say, what's our theme? And let's let's build that. It was probably a treatment. This is our story. This is beginning, middle, and end. And this is what happens to our characters. Then when they get to the end, it's like, okay, it seems like what we're getting is uh, a robot who is programmed to take care of things, to take care of, of a world. And suddenly he's given something to take care of that matters. And and I, I, mean, I don't know what the Wally theme is, <laughs> but... You go back and you're like, okay, how do we reinforce this? How do we make this stronger? And how do we show? And, and see, Wally is a really amazing accomplishment because he doesn't speak. You know what I mean? It would be so easy through dialogue to find out what Wally wants and what Wally feels and what Wally fears and what his attitude is. Yay, happy kind of thing because he's a perseverance and, and he's just, oh, so persistent and optimistic and, and the good that's inside all of us. And they accomplished that with little R2-D2 noises and, and little glass <laughs> binocular type eyes that somehow convey what he feels and what he wants. And, uh, you know, maybe all that stuff was there to begin with. But, but my guess is, you know, they had to decide what the movie was about before it became what it is. Yeah, I think... Like we said from the beginning, film writing is kind of a different process than novel or short story writing in that, for one, film writing tends to be much more of a cooperative kind of a thing. Almost never do you just have a guy sit down, write a script by himself, and then they go off and shoot that. Phantom Menace, it happened. Everywhere else, a bunch of people read it. They offer their advice. Uh, they bring in a co-writer. There's the director and all these other people who say, okay, we need to do this. We need to change that. There's a final script. When you write a script, first draft is white. And then second draft is a different color of paper. And when they, ch- when they change things in scripts, they keep just adding the colors in. And eventually, you'll have this rainbow-colored document that has all these new pages that have been added in to what you started out with, because you know they keep they they rewrite films to death. But it's because it's so much more collaborative. There's lots of people involved in it. Whereas a novel, there's a writer. You write your novel, you publish it under your name. And people read it if they want to or they don't. I mean, there's also different ways that everybody writes, too, when they write by themselves. Like the Pantsers versus the Planners. Is that the difference? I think you'd said the Planners and the Pantsers. But if you are a Pantser... Then you're probably this person who writes it and then goes, okay. When you get to the end, you uh, look back and you say, that's what this was about. You know, when I do my rewrite, I'm really going to emphasize I'm going to punch that up now. I'll add a scene about this. and Oh, okay. I, I think everybody probably has to do a little of that anyway. Even those uh, planners that planned it all out. A lot of times you'll get to the end and you'll be like, okay. Ooh, I, I think I need to put this. Because the, the, the theme's not really coming through like I wanted it to. So I need to throw this in here. Or whatever. And you'll go back and... Do a little bit. Even those that probably plan will be like, oh, this I must have been sleeping that day because this bit sucks. I really need to add something to that. But uh, theme is important, is definitely uh, the truth. And I guess sometimes you don't know what you got till it's gone. Wait, that's just a Cinderella song. It's um, the Cinderella song. <laughs> Every bad boy's got his soft side. (laughs) But yeah, sometimes uh, you have to stand back and take a look at it. And I'm sure 
the way they say it here, you know, it doesn't have to be when you're done all together, I would think. But at a point in the process, like you said, they had a treatment. I mean, that's one of the other things that they do in film writing is there's also, you know, you, you, you make your premise and, you know, you make your you expand that to like a treatment and you expand it to, you know, there's all sorts of different kind of down the line steps that you take as you're writing them. And I think deciding on the theme doesn't have to be done at the end of the first draft. It can be done like you were saying at the end of the treatment or whatever, which is, can be done. I think in prose in fiction writing as well, well. in the gauntlet, do you know what the theme is? I would say no, not yet. Um, I'm not sure what it'll be. Uh, I, ha- I I can probably come up with some... If I really sat down and thought about it, I think I would get it pretty quick. Because it is kind of to the point that I should know. But I'm not sure yet, to tell you the truth. So I guess when I finish the outline, then I can say, hmm, what is that theme? Although I think that's one of the things that... In the how-to outline book that I have, that's one of the things that they say, okay... You've done this, this, and this. Now let's talk about theme. What is your book going to be about? What are you trying to say? Maybe you ought to figure that out now. It seems that in something that's good, that resonates, you're able to pick out the theme easily. Like You know, like you were saying in the, in the class. But like, for example, the Shawshank Redemption. Hope is a good thing, and no good thing ever dies, is the theme of that movie, Right. And that's the quote, you know, that's repeated three times, I think, in the movie. And it's on the poster. <laughs> or no, no, it wasn't. My, my friend went to a signing with Frank Darabont. And that's what Darabont wrote on the Shawshank poster. Oh. And, I, and so I always think of that. Well, it is on the poster. It just depends <laughs> on which poster. of the posters you're talking about. But, uh, yeah, there were just one of those things that uh, it's easy when it's done well. To say that's the theme. You know, Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. It's the theme there, you know, just right, right? Or or is the theme, (laughs) you had the power to go home all along. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, no, I I mean, that could be the theme of a movie. But I I think, you know, there's no place like home is the, I don't know. Is there a theme to Wizard of Oz? Yeah, I would say it's probably that. I don't know. Maybe it's not. Maybe it is you had the power to go home all along. You didn't need the stupid slippers or whatever. Only bad witches are ugly. Yeah, that's probably the theme. That's probably it. It's probably we represent the lollipop guild. I think that's the theme. Does the theme have to be a line in the movie? No, I was just (laughs) saying. (laughs) All right. That is one of those things, though, that they talked about in our screenwriting class. You know, we had to sit down and make... He would have us watch particular movies and then make a step outline retroactively. We'd say, okay, this must be this step, and then there's this step. And he would say, there's usually about this many steps. And he wanted us to pick a line out from the the movie that would be the representation of this is the step. It was always so frustrating. Yeah. Because... He had the line in mind, and he'd say, this is the line. Yeah. And if you had a different line or whatever, you were wrong. Yeah, it and it'd just be so never, frustrating. There was no way to match his. But anyways, picking the line that says what they mean. Go find your smile. I remember that was one of the uh, lines. It was That's from City Slickers. City Slickers, yes. Anyways. I think, the, I think the line was, this is as happy as a puppy with two Peters. <laughs> yeah, that's probably it. Uh, this one's gone a little longer than we're supposed to have. We're made it to tw- like 28. I don't believe it because I, I didn't get this one, the theme thing. Well, we managed to talk about it. So there's that. Well, we did. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to call this a uh, wrap and we'll be back again tomorrow with some more. Thanks for listening. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Wiz Khalifa. Wow. That's why would I say that? Because you're California rich. That's right. Not better than you. (laughs) 
That Gets My Goat is produced under Creative Commons 3.0, attribution, no derivatives, share alike license. That means you can't sell it, but you can share it with everybody. It also means you have too much time on your hands. Is it okay if we let California reach in for a minute? I, he's out there <laughs> waiting. He is. I, there, there's no curtains on these windows, and so they're, and we have the lights on inside and it's dark outside, so it's hard to see out. But I kept seeing some kind of a, like a, just a, a figure going back and forth, like pacing. And I think the guy has, uh, he's like chain smoking a cigarette or something. And the guy does look like he's dressed like he should be in Miami Vice. So I, I guess that would be uh, California Rish out there, huh? I would not be able to pull off white pants at all. <laughs> but the white pants with the white jacket and the pink shirt? That's a it lot. Is. That's a lot to, but California Rish makes it work. I wish it's, I. It's got to be the confidence. 